After examining the knobs, let's move on to the next element, the block bevels. These represent the removal of a layer of stone along the joint line on the block's facing surface. And while knobs, due to their protruding shape, involuntarily draw attention, bevels remain mostly unnoticed, as they are often associated with familiar chamfers widely used in rusticated masonry. Yet, they belong to a different category of elements. Here are several primary reasons for using chamfers. The first, known from classical architectural sources, is to prevent edge chipping when debris gets under the block edges during installation. Such chamfers were typically cut at angles less than 90 degree, often around 45 degree, to prevent chipping and reinforce the corners. The second reason is to reduce the labor involved in finishing the surface. Once a chamfer was made along the perimeter, it was enough to align the block edges. The rest of the facade could remain rough. This style became widespread in certain regions. At the same time, in many cases where the facing surface was carefully finished, the chamfer served a third purpose, allowing precise alignment of the masonry course. As a result, the advantages of the method, in which only the margins of the block's facing sides are processed, while retaining the beautiful texture of natural stone on the wall surface, are clear. The difference with polycurved masonry is that the bevel cannot initially frame the entire block. This would be meaningless since the final shape of the block is unknown. Secondly, the bevel often differs in appearance between the lower and upper sides, while it tends to be nearly symmetrical on the lateral sides. This distinction is seen not only in Peru, but also in other regions where polygonal masonry occurs. This indicates the use of similar construction methods. The dependence of bevel shape on position suggests that its form is closely tied to the fitting process. When preparing a bedding joint, a broad bevel was made in the stone. The block set into this space had a strip of material removed along its lower side. Whereas a chamfer is typically made at a consistent width along the entire perimeter and independently of the fitting process. The contacting surfaces of the blocks and the chamfer are separate, unrelated elements. In free form and honeycomb masonry, the bevel cannot serve the purpose of maintaining the course alignment, one of the primary functions of a chamfer, since this requires the bevels to align along a continuous line. The facing surfaces of polygonal blocks are always dressed, so creating a bevel could not have resulted in significant labor savings associated with removing material from the facing surfaces. As for preventing chipping, these bevels cannot serve that function either, since they often form angles close to 90 degree, which in no way strengthens the block's edge. However, this also applies to many chamfers. To protect the edge of a block, the chamfer would need to be cut at a steep angle, possibly even rounded or made deeper. As we can see, the intended purposes of chamfers and bevels do not coincide in any respect. Chamfers reduce labor costs while bevels do not, and may even increase them. They do not reinforce the edges of the block. In general, bevels cannot be used to maintain the alignment of a masonry course. Additionally, chamfers and bevels differ in shape, and it should be noted that bevels were also made on the back sides of the blocks, whereas chamfers were not. It is evident that a bevel and a chamfer are fundamentally different elements with distinct purposes and creation processes. This raises the question, for what purpose was the bevel created? Supporters of concrete casting theories might argue that it was for cleaning the joints. But this option doesn't hold up, because solid stone doesn't flow over one another. In fact, the very presence of a bevel refutes the casting theory, since this element would be redundant, especially in cases where the bevel is well defined. Upon closer examination, one can notice that in many cases, the bevel breaks off at the end of the joint line. It's also noticeable that the bevel was made by sequentially removing material in several passes along the entire joint. This leads to the conclusion that the bevel was formed directly during the block fitting process. That is precisely why bevels are found only where blocks are joined. Where there is no joint, there is no bevel. If a block were made separately from the masonry using a surface transfer method, there would be no need for bevels. To precisely match two finished surfaces, a few control points would be enough. There's no requirement for a long continuous bevel. Therefore, bevels cannot be associated with facilitating block alignment. This means the bevel appears as a byproduct of the joining process itself, and the joining was performed not by a sequential method of separately finishing surfaces, but by a parallel one, eliminating the need for repeated fitting and repositioning.
At the same time, the parallel fitting method has its drawbacks and complexities, but those deserve separate discussion. There is a close connection between bevels and knobs. A bevel is never interrupted beneath a knob, indicating that nothing hindered its creation. In cases where a knob is located close to a joint, a narrow bevel still exists beneath it. At the same time, sometimes knobs are located right on the bevel, raising the question. If the block was being held by a log or stone, this would inevitably interfere with the jointing process. This issue could be solved by setting the block at a certain height. Another property of the bevels is that the recess under the knob is always at the same level as the bevel. There are no examples where the recess is deeper than the bevel. This technical detail suggests that the recess and the bevel were connected in the fabrication process. Moreover, sometimes the lower bevel is made alongside several recesses. Since the bevel is part of the joint surface that extends to the face, all these elements, the joint surface, the bevel, the recesses, and the knobs, are the result of a single process, the joining of blocks. A better understanding of this element can be gained from examining masonry where the bevels are minimal. Sometimes it may even seem like they aren't there. But this isn't the case. Where surfaces have been cleared of lichens, bevel strips can be seen. At the same time, the quality of block joining in terraces is lower than that in building masonry, suggesting that the bevel is related to the precision of the fit. Where requirements are lower, there are no bevels. A good example of masonry without knobs or bevels can be found in the lower terraces of Alente Tambo. The distinguishing features here are rough, convex face surfaces with numerous chips, numerous gaps at the meeting points of several joints, frequent use of the principle of adjusting the shape of the installed block to fit the existing masonry. In other words, the seating bed and its corresponding joint profile were not formed with smooth lines, as is observed in masonry with protrusions and bevels. One could even say that joint profiles were not used at all, and the blocks were fitted together based on their existing shapes without significant modification. Another feature is the use of blocks of varying sizes. Small insert blocks are typically rare in high-quality polycurve masonry. From these features, it can be concluded that this type of masonry is a simplified variant. This characteristic has been noted before, the existence of not only polygonal masonry with flawless joints, but also those that can be attributed to the same authorship and time period, though executed with less precision. It is evident that the Allantai Tambo terraces share a consistent style, and therefore a single authorship. Moreover, in the corners, the masonry transitions to higher quality work that can undoubtedly be classified as polycurve. At the same time, to say that bevels are completely absent would be incorrect, they are simply not well defined. The convex shape of the blocks is actually formed by the fact that the surface near the joint lines changes its level. There are no knobs because, as mentioned in a separate video, they only appeared in cases where a layer of rock was removed from the face of the block. In this case, it can be assumed that significant face surface processing did not occur. Recesses in the lower parts of the blocks, typically accompanying knobs, are often present. This makes it possible to answer the question of what came first, the recess or the knob. Since there are no knobs in this masonry, but recesses are present, it can be said that the recess preceded the formation of the knob. At the same time, the recesses themselves are rather plain in appearance as they are in the masonry within Alente Tambo itself. The absence of recesses and knobs is well explained by the fact that to support the block, one could use the lowest point, which did not require any further processing. In contrast, in high-quality masonry, where smooth joint profiles were used, such points simply do not exist. Additional insights can be gained by examining the rear side of the masonry. This is possible at Sacsayhuaman, where certain sections of the upper row are not covered with soil on the back side. It is clearly visible that bevels are also present on the rear sides of the blocks. In fact, they represent rock removal at a blunt angle. Facade bevels, especially lower ones, often show a similar form. This is particularly evident on the facing stones of the Pyramid of Menkar. Yet near the joint, the angle sometimes changes. So in reality, a bevel especially on the facade, is a composite element. Initially, the rock was removed at a certain angle, and then during joint formation, a second pass was made along a narrow strip. In some cases, the angle remained unchanged and the second stage can be identified by the higher quality of finishing. 
In the case of limestone, this stage may be revealed by an increase in the number of white marks, traces of tooling. And this is yet another distinction between bevels and chamfers in rusticated masonry, where the chamfer is created in a single pass and most often, with a standard width. In this case bevels could have served several functions at once. First, they provided convenient access to the joint surfaces. If the blocks protruded unevenly, consistent movement along the joint line would be difficult. Accordingly, in places where such access was not required, due to minimal jointing, bevels are also absent. Second, a bevel levels the surfaces, bringing them to a common plane during the stone removal process while joining. When material is removed at an angle, further bringing together of the side surfaces will inevitably lead to full contact along the joint line. For example, Rear bevels perform only this second function, the preliminary surface preparation, which indicates that access from the rear side was generally not necessary. Preliminary surface preparation is also observed when a block is joined to bedrock. The bevels on blocks and on the rock foundation do not differ from each other. It can be said that chamfers also perform the function of bringing surfaces to a uniform level. The difference lies in the fact that when a chamfer is made, the surface is defined from the beginning. Chamfers create static surfaces that do not change their appearance during construction. In the case of bevels, it's clear that during the joining process the edge was shifted. Therefore, the surfaces were dynamic and changed during the work. In quadrangular type masonry, access to the surfaces was provided by the very shape and size of the blocks, and so bevels are also minimal. Third, bevels could act as a support element, essentially an extended hidden knob. There are many examples of this, especially on the corner, megaliths of Saksai Huaman. Lastly, I would like to consider the megaliths of Baalbek. As is well known, this masonry is officially dated to the Roman period. Indeed, most of the blocks feature standard perimeter chamfers, with traces of the claw chisels, a familiar stoneworking tool used in antiquity and still in use today. However, the chamfers on the megaliths are entirely different and uncharacteristic of Roman-era masonry. These chamfers would be more accurately described as bevels, since they are composite elements, representing a combination of surfaces where the stone was removed at specific angles, transitioning into increasingly finer finishing. This is what makes them similar to the bevels of polygonal masonry. Likewise, in polygonal masonry, the bevel was more finely worked near the joint, sometimes even polished. The joint itself was treated similarly. In other words, the edge of the block appears to divide a finely finished surface into two parts. One remains on the lateral side and is responsible for the joint quality. The other remains on the face in the form of a bevel. The atypical bevel on the megalithic blocks of Baalbek resembles in form those found in polygonal masonry. However, distinct traces of claw chisels are present. This means that for the same task, precise block joining, we observe similar approaches, including the creation of complex bevels, but with different tools. In Peru, no distinct tool marks are found on the bevels. Situations where identical tasks are solved, using similar methods but different tools are quite typical. For example, in some regions, manual farming is done with a shovel, while in others, with a chacataclia. The same task of loosening soil is carried out in different ways. We observe exactly the same pattern in stoneworking. When constructing masonry with minimal gaps, the same principles are clearly visible, but different tools were used. Here are some additional examples. The granite casing of the Pyramid of Menkar demonstrates high joint quality and belongs to the same category as polygonal masonry. The key difference is the absence of deep seating beds. The joints between the blocks are flat, unlike the curved surfaces found in Peru. The curved surfaces serve to prevent block displacement a relevant consideration in seismically active regions. In Egypt, such seismic concerns were minimal, so the joints were made flat. Other features of polycurve masonry mentioned in the first part, precise joining, finely finished edges, recesses, and knobs, are all present. It's also evident that the blocks do not have rectangular shapes. Their lateral sides are often slanted, which is typical for quadrangular masonry. Bevels are also present. Their form is closer to that of rear bevels, a rock slope cut at a blunt angle. This form suggests that direct access to the jointing area was not required. Consequently, it differed from the one used in Peru. To this list, we can add the Kokur Pyramid in Cambodia, 
where recesses and occasional knobs are visible, along with marks from picks or chisels. In every region we see the same end result, achieved through similar methods but using different tools. And this clearly suggests that there was no single ancient highly advanced civilization, because in that case, we would expect the same tool technology to be used everywhere. What we observe are typical cultural patterns, both in stoneworking and in architectural styles. This clearly indicates that all these structures were built by local cultures. This makes the question of the motivations behind such construction both primary and universal. What goals were pursued? And how was the same result consistently achieved everywhere? What do all these structures with flawlessly joined blocks have in common? Bevels are one of the key elements, present only in polygonal and closely related types of masonry characterized by precise joining. In all other cases, from rusticated masonry to ceramic tiling, chamfers are used, serving entirely different functions. Furthermore, analysis of bevels and associated elements such as recesses and knobs allows us to distinguish between masonry with precise joints and rougher constructions. It helps trace the finer details of the precise fitting process. One might assume that block fitting was carried out in multiple stages. First, the side surfaces were shaped into general forms, without precise matching, possibly using flexible templates of various types. Then came the second stage, the precise joining, during which bevels, recesses, and later, with additional surface work, knobs would appear. Thank you for watching. See you next time.